Hi. So if you're familiar with the Netflix series called Wednesday, then you might remember that the titular character uses a typewriter. The model of that typewriter happens to be a Jewel Model 3, which was first produced in 1938 by the Jewel Typewriter Company in Köln, Germany. Given that, we have here the earliest mechanical iteration of the Jewel, the Dankers. This machine was first produced by J.A. Heiner in 1935 for the Dankers Company. This typewriter was sold to the Jewel Company until the latter's acquiring the production rights in 1936. Jewel would come to produce the models 1 to 4 throughout the following decade. And finally, the Jewel Rapid from 1953 to 1955. Now, going back to the Dankers, this is a very basic model with a minimum of features. Particularly, it did not have any color select mechanisms. So that means that basically you can only use the top part of the ribbon. So that means that if you wanted to use the bottom of the ribbon or if you had a bichrome ribbon with both black and red, in order to use that other side, you would have to remove and flip this ribbon around. Likewise, it did not have a bell for indicating the end of the line. And neither did it have a right margin. As you can see here, you are only able to set the left margin by moving this guy around. And that is in contrast to this Klein Urania, for example, where it does have a bell. And when you set the right margin, that implements a line lock mechanism to stop you from typing past the right margin or the end of the line. This machine also doesn't have an automatic ribbon reverse mechanism, meaning that basically once you exhaust one of the spools, you will have to manually press the respective button here. Well, in this case, it's just the end of a rod in order to flip the direction that the ribbon moves. So, for example, here, now it's rotating this direction. Press that, and now it's rotating this direction. Whereas many other more premium machines, or technically eventually became almost universal for every typewriter to have this mechanism, you would have some form of ribbon reverse mechanism like here where via tension or some eyelet, the pulling of this sense lever or some other trigger will trigger the reversal of the ribbon. Apparently, the original downcares came in three different models and was supposedly designed so that if you got one of the more basic models, you'd be able to add on the components that basically give you the exact same thing as the next upper models, and I believe then that that would basically allow you to, at the minimum, add a line lock mechanism, bell, of course a right margin, um, maybe a automatic reverse mechanism, not sure, but currently from photos that I've seen online, not even the later rapid models seem to have had a color selection mechanism, so they might have never implemented one. As for this particular example, I obtained it on German eBay for a pretty decent buy it now price, and rather surprisingly cheap shipping, at least compared to other sellers I've dealt with. Um, so, yeah, this here, decals are in pretty nice shape. Now, maybe some past owner tried cleaning this and caused the top of a gold leaf or whatever to get stripped off, revealing the silverish base. Um, now, as you'll see later in the mechanical coverage, this area here was originally rather dirty or like fogged, maybe due to some cleaner that was used, but fortunately that did go away after using some paper towel, mild detergent, and basically having to apply a bit more pressure than I normally do when wiping these surfaces, like when I brought back the original shine of this machine. Now, I'd say that it technically isn't that hard to find these machines, of course, the Jewel is much less common than Olympia, but like if you go on ebay.kleinenzeigen, um, the classifieds, um, they're, they're not that hard to find. Um, now, this particular example has a rather low serial number, which currently makes it the oldest downcares that I know of in the world. Uh, at least, I mean, yeah, currently the only other serial numbers that I've seen are like on the order of 2,000 or 8,000. So, yeah, pretty nice. 
As for what drew me toward this particular model of typewriter, it is how, much like this Klein Arani over here, which I discuss in this video, it uses a unique mechanism for relaying motion from the keys to the type bars for printing the characters on the page. Okay, so let's now look under the hood. So, again, as I had mentioned, this machine uses a rather interesting and unique type action. So basically, what we have are class 2 key levers, and your pivot block for the rear pivots here is all the way just in the middle here, as opposed to being further back behind the machine. Then, in an interesting fashion, the effort vertex of this class 2 lever is over here and pushes down on a special belt crank where its front pivot is implemented as a sliding or like corner rolling surface. Like so. So technically starts off resting on the front end, flattens, then loose like that. So this pulling down causes the bell crank end over there to finally be moved downwards. So in this case, unlike on most typewriters where your bell crank's arm is moving upwards to pull on the type bar links, instead it is pulling downwards. As for saving on production costs, it appears that they made all of these bell crank pieces here of an identical shape so that they can be machined or in this case probably stamped out of the same sheet metal die. And in this case, in order to accommodate the different key lever lengths and also just the different dimensions or like kinematic through which they are pulling on these type bars. Um, so more often what you see, let's just look inside the zoom back here, is a difference in the bell crank size to handle, to basically make it so that for the same depression of a key, regardless of where you are on the keyboard, the type bar will also move by the same amount. Or in this case, this like dimensioning of these bell cranks is partly to also help you have an even touch, or basically the same touch weight and general feel or force on each of the keys of the keyboard. So instead of investing on having dies for multiple different sizes and shapes of bell crank, they simply resort to using the exact same style of key lever and bell crank all across the keyboard, but they position the pivot accordingly in order to compensate. So in this case, for the longest key levers, they position the pivot further forward. That's because for the same displacement here, when it's longer over here, as opposed to here, then you'll actually get a larger displacement on your shorter key lever because of the ratio between this length and this length. So to compensate for that, for the longer keys, since there's a lower displacement, then we need this radius here of rotation to be smaller, while here, since there's a larger displacement at this point, we need to make that radius here longer. That way, the overall rotation of these bell cranks will become the same, or also compensated to handle the fact that these are not the same length, and they're pulling from different parts, and there might be some error because of this angling. Okay, so here we have a simulation of the same type action, as you can see here. So, key lever, in this case it is a class 2 key lever. So, effort, load, fulcrum. Um, so, yeah, on the actual machine there would be a piece of felt here, under this bar. So, this class 2 lever, via this pivot, 
push us down on this spell crank and yeah compared to the grand majority of portable type actions that I've gone over namely these ones where they still use a class 2 key lever but as you can see now we have this class 1 bell crank so yeah this is the more common or conventional style of delivering motion from your keys to the type bars but here we now instead have a rather interesting sort of bell crank namely a class 3 bell crank so fulcrum effort load but now our fulcrum is of a sliding form or technically kind of slightly changes in position throughout the stroke so again as i had shown on the actual machine it starts over at this point then it flattens out and shifts to this corner over here and while in that state it's able to have just a bit of sliding just some minor sliding there you can see over there alternatively you could regard this as a class one bell crank um, at least from the reference point of the key lever and with that then you have a force coming over here starting from this side eventually progressing to this point and then that applies torque which rotates this end with the load which finally pulls our type bar link like so you might notice that while during the press the this piece here is held against this upper surface of that bar but as you can see we can lift this just fine and indeed this is also possible on the actual machine itself um, so that basically means that yeah your type bar um, if you constrain the key lever to not move, your type bar is still capable of moving. Now, theoretically, what this means is that if you press the key especially hard, then the force or impulse applied to this mechanism might be sufficient such that even while, say, for example, you let go of the key at this position, then it might stay right here, while the type bar, the rest of the type bar, is able to move under its own momentum, independent of the key lever. Um, so theoretically, that might help with the speed or basically your ability to press a key and release it sooner um, without having to do a full follow-through, and that in turn allows you to type faster. Um, but it could just be purely because of the fact that they just designed this thing out of curiosity, it's trying different things, and of course, in order to not infringe on other people's patents. And again, I'd say that there are indeed some savings in the production costs thanks to their using this exact same shape here or profile for every single bell crank. And that is enabled by their simply, like let's say that if the key here moves down, let's say more realistically around this much here, then if you want to have a shorter key, you know what, let's go ahead and splice this. Um, <laughs> yeah, say that we've moved the key over here and we want it to still move down by a certain distance. So right now it's only moving that far and we want it to be able to move deeper or basically to the same depth as it was when it was a longer key. Then that can be achieved by simply moving this pivot here further toward the back of the machine so let's say right over here that increases this radius meaning that this here this part here will need to have a larger displacement in order to obtain the same displacement or angular displacement of this bell crank and as you can see um, we've kind of overcompensated since uh, well Okay, that's fair. Yeah, that's basically equalized it. So again, over here, we were seeing almost two centimeters of displacement. Now we've achieved the same here. Now we can look at the force curve. So for a primer in that, see this video over here or in the video description. So there we go. So again, basically the, the 
x-axis is the y displacement of the key. So since it's decreasing, then we're actually starting from the right toward the left. And then the y-axis of this graph is the net force on our simulated finger here. So given that, we can see now this initial stuff here where it kind of like increases, I'd say that's probably more so due to limitations in the rigidity of Algodoo's simulation. So the problem with Algodoo is that um, how rigid or how less prone parts are toward clipping into each other depends on the weight or density of these respective parts. And currently you can't really do anything about that. I mean, you can alter, like there is a way to alter the inertia. So you can make it behave like a lighter mass, but you can't change how it gets affected by gravity. <laughs> so that's rather annoying. Um, unless I were to make everything be of the exact same super high density and with an appropriately lower inertia multiplier and scale down gravity, then maybe that would give me more rigid simulations, but otherwise, yeah, we still have those limitations and we would still have some like springiness or stretchability within these simulated hinges. So that's a limitation of this particular software, but at least this is quite easy for me to use. So after that artifact, we then have a rather steep decrease in force before it plateaus out and then increases increasingly. So generally, this kind of shape, or bowl shape, I associate with a high quote-unquote tactility, or like a bump um, that you feel on your fingers. Um, now this is the opposite of the kind of bump that you would get on a... Like, for example, if you are currently using rubber dome switches, um, then you'd normally have a more positive arc instead. But you actually do get a kind of similar, like it's... I personally have difficulty telling these particular feels apart. Like, they just both feel like a bump. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyways, the significance then is that this kind of bump is quite similar to that of the torpedo, which looks like this. Um, so, yeah, again, bowling in this case... It's kind of not as steep, like even if you were to scale these four curves. So here it starts steeper, so yeah, indeed I do personally find the tactility of the torpedo to be a bit smoother. As for this rise at the end, here I've simulated a bit more, so yeah, the down curves here also does have that rise. Um, though yeah, this generally isn't very noticeable, like at the end of the keystroke, especially when you also have the forces contributed by the escapement actuation or ribbon mechanism actuation. So for individual keystrokes, it does theoretically feel similar to the Torpedo 18B, though yeah, in person it does feel more so um, like deeper, heavier, but it is still quite easy to control, at least to my fingers, and yeah, this machine does type quite fast, as you will see. As for the Type R angular velocity with respect to time, that looks like this. So, yeah, again, as with most machines I've simulated, it's basically, regardless of your force curve, the Type R itself is actually accelerating at a constant rate. And in this case, um, what I've found is that actually, whether or not this is increasing or decreasing, really just depends on the strength of how I've set the spring coefficient or its starting displacement. Um, so, but yeah, again, generally even in person, like when you're adjusting these typewriters or designing them, if you install heavier springs or if you set it to a higher touch control where these springs start off more stretched, then though your type bars will return faster, your touch will also be heavier, making it harder um, to like yeah, press them and also more difficult for you to release the keys more quickly. So, yeah, basically there's a whole kind of balance between whether or not to make these springs heavy or light um, in order to maximize your typing speed. As for the shift mechanism, it operates under a similar principle as the Antares and Silver Psycho machines. And that basically means that instead of having a parallel linkage to allow your carriage to basically move more parallel up and down. Let's take this Olympia here, for example. You can see it's all straight. And here. Uh, yeah, just imagine that they're parallel linkages. Um, actually, you can see more detail on that in this video. So instead of that, we have the K 
carriage here, moving about a single pivot. So, yeah, basically that's one other way to do things. I'd say kind of typically it gives for like a lighter carriage shift operation or just different style or feel. Potentially could save some parts, but anyways. So, yeah, so in terms of the Antares and Silver Seiko, those two machines have different ways of conveying motion to their single pivoted carriage shift. Well, in this case, for this machine, its approach is to simply use the exact same bell crank style as for all these keys. So, yeah, exact same shape there. In this case, they position the pivots accordingly for their purposes. But yeah, it's pulling that link. That link then pulls on that bell crank, on which is attached to what I call the shift shaft. That basically just links the two sides so that yeah, both of your shift keys will be mostly symmetrical. In this case, there's actually a pin and slot. So there's a slot that engages with the pin on that lever extending from our carriage here. I mean, technically, since the weight or load is at the center, then you could call this a class 2 lever. Then, for the shift lock, this is just a simple mechanism. Probably better to show you here. Yeah, it's starting to rain. So, a yeah, simple hook that grabs on. And when you press a key, it releases with the help of that spring. As for the backspacer, again, same principle. So there's a link, and it pulls all the way somewhere at the back of the machine. So for that, we'll need to look under. And there you can see that bell crank. So that's pulling on that link, which is also pulling on this other piece here. So it's shaped like a 90 degree so that it will start off out of the way of the carriage or escapement rack. Then during backspacing it will be pulled into the way. As you can see, it is grabbing onto a tooth and pulling the carriage back. And yeah, that piece there is on a linear bearing or a slider. So that's your slider. Over here, you can better see how that backspacing pole is being moved into the position to grab onto the escapement rack. As for the space bar, that's simply implemented with a class 1 lever in this case. So first we have our pivot here, that's our load, then our effort is over here, that pulls up on that link there. In this case I actually had to uh, bend that link a bit to improve the sensitivity of the spacebar. Um, that was mainly because when I tried to, well number one, I think this set screw is already damaged, so um, I can't really use it to make any adjustments, unfortunately. Um, but at least right now I have the spacebar as sensitive as I want. It's also possible that that padding over there has yeah, been like compressed and worn down such that the spacebar kind of rests a bit higher than ideal. As a result, yeah, you have to press the spacebar a bit more deeply than I would like. Anyways, yeah, that eventually finally pulls back on the exact same universal bar here. So here, 
you can see now those bell cranks of uniform shape and how they actually push against that universal bar, like so. And that in turn, in a class two fashion, pulls on that link. So firstly over here, we can actually see the ribbon drive. So that's a rather simple pair of hulls, which are you know, kept together with a torsion spring. And this here is designed so that in one direction, in this case, the lower, or in this case, the rear pole will be pushing. And then on the release, the upper pole will be pulling. So this is one case where the ribbon advance is actually being engaged both on the press and release whereas on some typewriters the ribbon is either moving only on the press or only on the release. So I'd say that yeah this machine technically has a fairly fast moving ribbon um, and then after that we end up with basically a Remington or Underwood style ribbon advanced transmission just with bevel gears um, though technically the ribbon advance or ribbon reverse is more so Remington style, while on the Underwoods I believe this part would rock back and forth, or probably depends on whether it was an earlier or later Underwood portable. Um, so yeah, that just rotates. In this case, this machine is quite simple, doesn't have any automatic ribbon reverse. Also note that on that spacebar link here, it's shaped so that, though you can engage the spacebar, when only the key is being pressed, it will not additionally lower the space bar. So again, that's a typical decoupling mechanism to make sure that during normal typing, the escapement operation will not potentially be slowed down or made heavier by the forces from the space bar. Now for the actual escapement. Uh, it's rather hard to see on this machine. But yeah, you can see there, there's that link. So, yeah, it's pulling there in a class 3 fashion. Yeah, I'd call this a class 3 bell crank. So, okay. I'm not sure if this bolt here is eccentric and whether or not that can be used for escape and trip adjustment. Uh, but regardless, it pushes on that surface. As you can see here, depending on the shifted state, it will still be able to engage. And yeah, this is a simple rocker. There's your floating dog engaging. Then for your ribbon vibrator, that's over here, right there, okay. So yeah, this lever here is being pulled, and it's basically constrained between this sliding point here and this pivot on this class 1 lever, which, as you can see there, so even the space bar on this machine will lift the open vibrator. Now supposedly the dankers and jewel were provided in three versions, whereby if you get a simpler version then you should be able to just pay to actually add on the color selection mechanism, though in this case I currently don't know how said color selection works, or how it would have been added. Um, anyways, so... Yeah, this guy here would be for... Probably a skating rocker... 
adjustment for limiting the motion with the escapement rocker. How far it can move up and down. Ah, okay, yeah. So this here, this here is your actual escaping trip. So you can see this piece is being pulled, and depending on the position of that screw, it will either trip the escapement earlier or later. But again, your escaping trip still needs to be balanced between your spacebar and your keys. So if you have managed to get your keys to trip decently late, then you also want to make sure that your spacebar is sufficiently sensitive. You might have noticed that this machine also doesn't have a line lock mechanism. So basically nothing, and also no bell, so yeah, nothing to really tell you um, when the end of the line has been reached or to stop you from typing past your right margin. Um, so yeah, again, very basic machine. Makes things a bit easier to explain as to how the thing works. Um, I need to get a bit of a better view of the escapement from this end. Kind of. Yeah, it's just a basic rocker. Fairly conventional. And, yeah, no way to actually trip a bell, or even at the very end of the line, stop you from piling letters. And finally, on this side, we have the line advance. So currently, we already have the, the ratchet release engaged. So that's just a basic cam mechanism here. And the pivot for that, I believe, is the same as the platen shaft. So yeah, this is just affixed to the platen shaft, and that cam pushes that detent out of the way. Then, for actually engaging or advancing the line, we have a fairly conventional mechanism. Oh, actually, in this case, they're using something similar to how their backspace works. So we have this pawl on a slider, and now instead of pulling it, we're pushing it with this piece here. So, yeah, that's how that works. And finally, they decided to make things quite simple for the line spacing selection. So right now, single spacing or two half spaces. A lot of European machines do half spacing. So all I have to do is just push this guy up if you want to do one, two, three, one and a half spacing. So that's your one and a half spaced lines. As for mechanical changes found in the later models, um, I'm going to be referring to these different links here. So firstly, mainly from the typewriter database, links in the description. So yeah, that's what your Jewel Model 2 looks like. Now in terms of underneath the machine, um, we can see here that compared to on my Dancares, as well as other photos of this model, it's basically the exact same escapement design, um, where you have a rocker that engages directly with the carriage rack. Likewise, there's no bell. And yeah, all the other mechanisms are virtually the same. So that's for that. Then, specifically on the Jewel Model 3, it seems that the presence of a bell at the back of the machine came to be more common. Um, you can also see that over here. Though what I don't yet know is how you were supposed to adjust the right margin if it even had one. Uh, because, yeah, this bell is stuck here and... Yeah, I don't see any right margin adjustment or see what exactly would trip this bell uh, while you're typing. So, yeah, the carriage would be moving 
in this direction. Um, but yeah, I'll just imagine that there is in fact something that pushes on this bell, and it may or may not be adjustable. Um, here's another example of an earlier jewel, so I got that from this site here. And that would basically be the same as on mine here. Um, though yeah, here it's not painted black, or anodized or whatever, or cold blued, I don't know the term. Um, but yeah, the point is, yeah, basically no changes from the Dancares to the early jewel models. Same thing here with the shift mechanism, that hasn't changed. Here's the underside of that now. So yeah, same mechanisms, but we do see a difference being that now we have these two supports coming from the rear bottom of the frame all the way to the segment assembly. So I guess they added those for additional stability and as you'll see, my machine and any other downstairs that you would see would not have that. So no brace from here to here. Then we have for the later 1950s Jewel Rapid, in this case we have Richard Polt's example. Um, so looking under that machine, we can see that they've relocated the bell. So as you might have seen from my other videos, this is in fact a rather common position to put the bell on most portable typewriters. Uh, between the 30s and 60s, etc. Um, and likewise, they updated the escapement design. So instead of having your, like, what are called escapement dogs, which are rocking back and forth, contacting a rack, as I'd shown earlier, now you have a more conventional escapement, as you would have seen in my other videos, that engages with a, an escape wheel. Um, so if you're familiar with clocks, then yeah, you might get a bit of the idea, except that now you have the teeth, instead of rocking in a planar position, now they're moving perpendicular to the plane. And then that escape wheel would have a pinion that engages with a rack. So yeah, this is a more common design, um, which I think even dates back to the Scholes and Glidden. Now, what I don't know is if this machine actually has a line lock, furthermore, like in these photos, I can't really tell if the Jewel Model 3 or even the Model 2 and whatnot added a line lock mechanism. Um, likewise, in all photos that I've seen of Jewel typewriters, I haven't been able to see whether or not they added a color select mechanism. So it is possible that though the original Dan Cares was provided with three like different models or with more and more features, they may have never ever offered a color selection. And here we have the final iteration, the 1955 version of the Jewel Rapid. Um, as you can see, much more streamlined look, um, definitely reminiscent of the Olympia SM4 or SM3, uh, more on that in this video. Um, and yeah, as you can see, no sign of a color select mechanism, not even a tabulator, whether or not they've ever provided that. And yeah, underneath, it's basically the same as in this earlier rapid. I mean, yeah, these are only like about two to three years apart, so you wouldn't expect very many changes. Same new escapement, same new bell. Whether or not there is also a new line lock mechanism. All right, it is now time to type. So for feeding paper, simply... Now, yeah, in this case, there's actually no paper release lever that we have to flip first. Um, since in order to achieve a paper release, you simply have to pull the paper table forward. Um, now for the line finder, or the ratchet release, again, simply push that guy. And, yeah, this example still has pretty decent feed rollers. And yeah, here I'm just using this technique to allow me to adjust the page. And I like aligning it with the bail here, the line scale. So that's that. 
Okay, good. As you can see, we currently don't have our left margin set yet. To do that, we need to go over here. Again, this model did not have a right margin, so that means that the only way that you can tell the end of the line is visually. Um, now, most machines came to have their margins positioned right on the carrot itself. This machine puts the margin bar directly on the chassis. So, anyways, yeah, so there, that's your left margin. And that should look good. Okay, so we're ready to type. Keep forgetting that's already 2023. <laughs> February date is 19th, 6 07. Shift lock. Rather well, quite pleasantly performant machine, and you did see there that it actually automatically uh, did a double space, that's because I had this guy lifted. Once you press that down, then I'll get single spacing. So, yeah, for such a basic machine, um, and one that uses a normal, or your older style of universal bar instead of a behind segment U-shaped universal bar, this is actually quite a nice and performant machine. Pretty carriage clickable too. So, like, basically, my technique for fast carriage returns. Yeah, pretty nice, and I'm not getting any, like, margin bouncing, or basically, no issues where it ends up landing one space to the left or right. So, that means that, yeah, I'm getting nice and reliable left margin hits. Um, like, yeah, some, some machines will have troubles with that, and you'll need to make adjustments either to the escapement or the margin bar in order to fix that. And yeah, it can get annoying when you're trying to do faster typing, but typically won't be so annoying like if, if you type at a more leisurely pace and care to turn like this. Um, but yeah, I like pushing out all of the performance possible from these typewriters. Um, yeah, of course, when I'm pushing it this far, I might get some type bar collisions here and there. Yeah, so again, as you would have seen earlier when I covered the mechanism and the force curve of the type action. Um, yeah, basically, now initially I thought that would be like a more art force related to the Underwood style type actions, but it's really actually more related to the Torpedo style of force curve, or namely the Torpedo 18 series at least, since I recently learned that the Torpedo 15, and likewise that real successor, the Torpedo 30, uses a rather different mechanism, but anyways, so yeah, it's really nice and full, kind of heavy, but satisfyingly tactile touch, snappy, again, this machine, don't get a bell, um, right now, the original ribbon, I did turn it over, and with that, I'm able to squeeze out more life from it, um,
Okay, yeah, so this is a case where I have to do a manual ribbon reverse, otherwise we'll end up typing on the exact same spot. So now this spool. So this spool is full, this spool was empty, and is now being wound. see <laughs> looks like there's a bit of a pickup with the line feeding anyways so you know, pull the paper table forward then you can yeah then you can pull the paper out um so yeah very wonderful machine quite pleasant to type on um indeed rather different touch from this machine which i also absolutely love typing on so yeah two machines here with quite unique mechanisms and indeed a wonderful typing experience. Given that, I very much do recommend this model as well as its dual successors. Surely they should all have a similarly wonderful typing feel. Given that, if you found this video interesting and would be interested in more typewriter content, feel free to like and subscribe.